Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very, very thankful for the Sabbath, um, for the time that we have together as we worship you, as we study your word, as we look at Adventist history, and we invite your presence into our hearts, into our study. We know, Lord, there's many things that we do not fully understand, many things we need to learn, things that we have to unlearn. And we just ask, Lord, that um, that each day as we seek you, that you can continue to teach us and that we can grow in Christian character, that we can become like Christ in how we act, how we treat others. We ask, Lord, that you can reveal to us our need of you, our sins, that we can have a, a strong conviction of the power of your truth, and that this will make us wise unto salvation. We pray for each person. We ask for your angels' care and protection. And we ask for your blessing to be poured out upon this Sabbath. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening and happy Sabbath, everyone. Now, uh, the topic today is related to our study on uh, Revelation 12, 13, and 17, which has been derived from the study that Colin has done on the presidents of the United States in implying, applying the, the, the puzzle or the, uh, the riddle of, you know, five are fallen, one is, one is yet to come. He must continue a short space in the eighth and so forth. And he's applied this to, to Trump in the eighth. And so we know that um, we've spent time over the last, uh, I think last one was number seven. So we spent seven weeks studying this, uh, if I remember correctly. And in studying this, uh, we've we've covered a lot of ground that we really never expected to. And the main, the, the basic plan that we had was uh, to go through Revelation 12, 13, and 17 and understand, uh, you know, sort of erasing any assumptions and looking at what the pioneers taught and understanding these prophecies, looking at some of the, the things that, that we could be sh certain of and other things that we were less certain of. And so what we're looking at today relates to Revelation 13, specifically the image of the papacy. So this is going to be Revelation um, 13 verses, uh, I can't remember, is it 12 to 18, something like that. And in, in doing this, what you see in front of you is the 1850 chart. And, and we know that the 1850 chart is part of the foundation of the message. And Ellen White endorses this chart, just like she does the 1843 chart. But what you see in front of you, this image of the papacy, is a, a statement that would not be well accepted either by this movement or by Adventism in general. Now, we're, so we're going to look at this. And we're going to try to understand how the pioneers understood this and what that means for our understanding of how we're looking at prophecy today. So we're going to just jump into this statement here. Um, when we look at the 1850 chart, we know that the different beasts of Revelation uh, 12, 13, and 17 are on these charts. They got the Mohammedans, uh, they got the pagan Rome beast, the papal Rome beast. And this is near the bottom of the chart here, the image of the papacy. So I, I never really expected the, in my view of it, for the image of the papacy or the lamb-like beast to look like this, but this is the way that it's drawn. So it's got two horns like a lamb, but it spake as a dragon. And um, it says, the two lamb-like horns, republicanism and Protestantism, whose names number 666, become united in action, speak like a dragon, and control the civil legislature 
and cause it to make the church the image of papacy, which received a deadly wound and was healed. And Revelation 17, verse 13 and 14, they quote, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, the executive power they have there in brackets, and causeth all to receive their mark and worship their image. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and Kings, King of Kings. Revelation 13, 11 to 18 is then uh, referenced. Now, <clears throat> what does this mean? I mean, uh, if if you were looking at this and reading this, and you, you, what would you, how would you interpret what we just read? Especially in relation to six six six. Any thoughts? When pe people, I'll try to make it a little bit bigger here for people. So. Why is it not going bigger? There we go. Oops. So just so you can see the text itself a bit bigger. Okay, well, let's let's break this down. The two lamb-like horns. So what are the two two horns? Uh, Republicanism and uh, Protestantism. Okay. Now, when you look at this on this chart. Uh, I don't know how well people can see it, but what do you notice about those words, Republicanism and Protestantism? Look at the they're, font. Yeah, they're in a different font. Yeah, they're in a different font. And you can also see that uh, a type of whiteout had been applied and that these are placed over top of what was originally written there. People notice that. Yeah, I see that. Okay. So, so originally on the 1850 chart, it didn't say Republicanism and Protestantism. Because they made this in 1850. And Jane Andrews um, is the one who came up with the idea that the two horns represented Republican and Protestantism. Now, the suggestion by Froome is that it said Papist and Protestant. Um, so whether that's correct or not, I have no way of verifying it. We only have the one 1850 chart. We don't have other copies of it. And, um, so we don't know particularly what it originally said. At least I haven't been able to find out if that's correct. And it says whose name's number 666. So what, what do you think that means? The name's number 66. Anybody know what that would mean? Well, it says names. Names more than one. Okay. So, yeah, so it has names where we know the text says uh, the name uh, in, in the scriptures, just to look at the verse itself. For it is a number of a, a man, and his number is 603 score and six. So it's the number of the beast. It doesn't say anything about names numbering 666. Right. So if we take what it originally said, it said the two lamb-like horns, papist and Protestant, um, whose names number 666, become united in action, speak like a dragon, and control the civil legislature and cause it to make it says the church but originally it says themselves so it doesn't say the church there to make themselves the image of papacy which received a deadly wound and was healed so if we talk about uh this this beast that has lamb-like horns whose name's number 666, and it's going to make themselves the image of the papacy. I mean, who could this be talking about in the context of how they're looking at it on the 1850 chart? OK, 
Anybody have thoughts about it? I don't know how many people have looked into this before. Okay, I'm going to look at a Spirit of Prophecy quote here. Now, this is an early quote of Ellen White's. It's... Um, uh, Six 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 would be the number of a man. Yeah. Um, not, yeah. not Republicanism and Protestantism. Oh, right. So so what we have to do is we have to understand how the Millerites understood this, first off. So I mean we have our understanding of it. And we want to look at the pioneers' understanding of it. Um and what's on the eighteen fifty chart and also before. So Miller's understanding of it. Um this is a statement from A Word to the Little Flock by Sister White. It was published by uh, Joseph Bates. And she says, I saw that I saw all that would receive the mark of the beast and of his image in their foreheads or in their hands could not buy or sell. I saw that the number and in brackets 666. Yes, I'm still showing the chart. If you want, I guess I can switch to Ellen White's. Uh, um statement if you want okay so it'd probably be helpful okay uh, i saw all that would receive the mark of the beast and of his image in their foreheads or in their hands could not buy or sell i saw that the number 666 of the image beast was made up and that it was the beast that changed the sabbath and the image beast had followed on after and kept the popes and not God's Sabbath. And all were as all and all were required to do. And all we were required to do was to give up God's Sabbath and keep the popes. And then we should have the mark of the beast and of his image. Now, so this is. Very early vision of Alan White's. Um, so we have this image beast. So what's the image beast? How, how are they understanding the image beast? Based on this statement, how is Ellen White understanding the image beast? So we have the beast here. Who's the beast that changed the Sabbath? Papacy. Pope. So the papacy, right? And then the image beast that followed on after, who would that be? It would be the United States. Okay. Yeah, so, so it would be the United States, but they're thinking of it more as in this context, uh, the Protestant churches. So, so we would say it's the United States because we understand that it's the United States. Well, the Protestant this, churches is one of the horns of the United States, right. takes up the United States. So, yep. I think. Uh, but that wasn't understood early on. So this is 1847. They never had, uh, they did not teach that the, the two horns were uh, Republican in Protestantism until after the 1850 chart was printed. So when they're looking at this back in 1847, uh, they're going to see that, the, that this image beast has to re that relates to the Protestant churches. That's the part that they're focused on here. Um, so the mark of the beast and of his image, this is going to be Sunday observance, right? So when she says we have to keep up, give up God's Sabbath and keep the Pope's, she's talking about uh, the Sunday, right? So this is about the Sunday law test. So this is eight, 1857, very early on in their understanding of these things. 
and what God had revealed to, to Ellen White. So she sees this in vision, right? So when she says, I saw, uh, the focus that is here is on the fact that the Protestant churches are going, are following the Pope Sabbath and not the Bible Sabbath. Now, when she says, I saw that the number 666, 666 is added by Joseph Bates. At least that's the, the understanding of it. The number of the image beast was made up. But even if you take that Joseph Bates added this, when she says, I saw that the number of the image beast was made up, what would she be referring to? What, what would be the number of the image beast? Would that be 666 or would it be something else that she's referring to? So are you saying that you believe that 666 was an added piece? Well, this is this is the the generally received opinion because anything that's in brackets in this word to the little flock um, is either a Bible reference or this one case, this 666. But to me, it doesn't matter whether it's added or not. The point is, if we see that she, the number that she's talking about, could it be anything other than 666? Is there any other number associated with the image beast? I was thinking 1260, maybe? Well, the number of the image beast was made up, the 1260, the image beast if this is protestantism we don't have 1260 attached to the image beast and the other only other number maybe would maybe there would be more but i'm thinking two uh, two horns okay that's an interesting idea i've never thought of that but what about what about 538 okay but she's talking about that this number was made up that means Whatever this number is, it's now come come to the point uh, where it's it's made up, right? That not not it's like created, but it's you know like we make something up. But it's it's now totaled up is another way we could say it. Is that like saying that this is completed? Yeah, it's complete. Yeah. yeah. So the number of the image beast is made up or completed, right? Now. Now, if we're going to talk about the number of the image beast being completed, well, this is 1847. So to, to, so to understand what Ellen White is talking about, this is something she sees in vision. Um, would we say that the best number that we could put there, if we're going to say what the number of the image beast was that was completed, would it be the number 666 or some other number? Theodore, I, I would like to make a small comment. I, okay. Because it's saying the, the 666 and it's speaking of a making up or a completion and then it mentions a 666. Could that be referring in any way to the threefold union? Okay. Well, okay. So let's, let's look back a little bit of what she's talking about here. Okay. So we're going to read the paragraph before. I saw that if God had changed the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day, he would have changed the writing of the Sabbath commandment written on the tables of stone, which are now in the ark in the most holy place of the temple in heaven. And it would read thus. Um, um, the first day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. But I saw that it read the same as when written on the tables of stone by the finger of God and delivered to Moses in Sinai. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, Exodus 20.10. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is, and will be, the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers, and that the Sabbath is the great question, to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. And if one believed and kept the Sabbath, and received the blessing attending it, and then gave it up and broke the Holy Commandment, they would shut the gates of the holy city against themselves, as sure as there was um, a God that rules in heaven above. 
I saw that God had children who do not keep the Sabbath. They had not rejected the light on it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. This enraged the church and nominal Adventists as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. So nominal Adventists referring to the first day Adventists. And at this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth and they came out and endured the persecution with us. And I saw the sword, famine, pestilence, and great confusion in the land. The wicked thought that we had brought the judgments down on them. They rose up and took counsel to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil would be stayed. I saw that all would not receive the mark of the beast and of his image in their foreheads or in their hands, could not buy or sell. I saw that the number of the image beast was made up and that it was the beast that changed the Sabbath and the image beast had followed on after and kept the popes and not God's Sabbath. And all we were required to do was to give up God's Sabbath and keep the popes and then we should have the mark of the beast and of his image. In the time of trouble, we all fled from the cities and villages. So one of the things you can see here, if we're reading in context, when she says, I saw the number of the image beast was made up, is she talking in her present day or in is she speaking of the future of the events that she's talking about that are going to happen? So let's try to decide that. In the future. Okay. Yeah. So I would say it's in the future that she's not saying that the number of number of the image beast is made up in her day, because in the context here, she's talking about the future, both in the paragraph before and in the paragraph after. So that's the way that I would read it. But when you just read the sentence by itself, it sounds like she's saying that the number of the beast is already completed in her day, but that's not the case. Now, so this is, what's that, Chris? I have a comment. Um, When you read that, I, I got the distinct feeling she's talking about the number of the people who would make up those who worship the beast. Yeah. See, so I would think that when we talk about the number, we have, remember, we have another number, 144,000. And so the number here would be the number of people. Now, the way that this was interpreted by Adventists at this time was that this number had to do with the number of churches. So they believed that there were 666 Protestant churches and that that number was already completed. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, um, this is, uh, Damsteed gives a summary of, so I've actually read all the articles that Damsteed's going to um, reference here. So I did a lot of reading. Uh, So everything that he refers to here, I've already read. but he's going to talk here about the image beast. So I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see this. So Damsteed's book, this is the book, uh, Foundations of Seventh-day Adventist Message and Mission. And here is, this is about the image beast. So this is just the history of, of the different views that were held. Finally, after having defined the beast and the two horned beast, Andrews interpreted the image of the beast Revelation 13, 14 and fi- uh, 13 verses 14 and 15 on the basis of his previous interpretation that the beast was in truth a church clothed with civil power and authority by which to put to death the saints of God. He drew the conclusion that an image to the beast then must be another church clothed with civil power and authority to put the saints of God to death. So he gives the reference here. This is, uh, why is it not giving me that reference? I don't know why it doesn't do that anyway. Maybe it's because I'm sharing it. It doesn't like that. Okay. Anyway, it gives a reference where this is quoted from. 
This, Andrew said, could be nothing else but the corrupt and fallen Protestant church. In the context of the Sabbatarian Adventist view, oh, I know it's wrong here, just hang on. Okay, so that was a book written by Andrews called Revelation, page 84. Okay, it shows up on my other page. Um, so this, Andrew said, could be nothing else but the corrupt and fallen Protestant church. In the context of Sabbatarian Adventist view of Babylon of the second angel's message, this interpretation was not surprising. So, so they're looking at um the message of the second angel what that is a reference to is babylon is fallen is fallen that's the second angel's message so that's how they're applying this focusing on um so it says Lofborough further elaborated the concept of the image of the beast focusing on the church state relationship he stated all that is wanting to complete the image of papacy is simply a union of action in church and state and for the churches to have control of the laws so as to inflict penalties on heretics or those who do not obey their sentiments. Now, Loughborough is quite a bit later. Um, this statement by Loughborough is, uh, when is that? Well, it doesn't say, it just says TBH, page 74. I'm not sure what TBH is. Um, But anyway, Loughborough is not at the same time of J as Jan Andrews. So it's a later publication. But, but this is how they came to understand it. The fact that several states had provided a legal basis for Sunday observance, he saw as evidence that the image was in the process of being formed. And its completion was to take place in the USA in the near future after the abolishment of the separation of church and state. He predicted that that were the United States as a body to pass a law that Sunday should be kept holy or not profaned by labor, there would be, I conceive, an image to papacy, for law would then be in the hand of the church, and she could inflict penalties on those who did not obey the Sunday institution. It was only when moral restraint was taken from men and the honest in heart have been called from Babylon, he explained, that a decree will be passed that all who will not worship keep the laws of the image shall be killed. Then you, shall, then you will witness a living image breathing out the venom of Romish inquisition, of a Romish inquisition. Andrew saw a typological relationship between the condition of Daniel's three friends when a decree was issued to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. So that's Daniel 3. And you can see how our understanding of Daniel 3, that this is the Sunday law, and Colin's study, he's focusing on Daniel 3, the image of the golden image, which he's paralleling with the image of Daniel 2, as being the United States, and he's applying this riddle uh, to this image, just as we have the kingdoms of uh, Daniel chapter 2, we have those same kingdoms in the beast of revelation 17 so when we apply the riddle uh, we're going to see five or fallen one is and we're going to be talking about the presidents of the united states um so so to try to understand that uh we're going to come back to that we're going to come back to call and study in the future but right now you can see the connection here that when we're talking about revelation 13 we're connecting this to Daniel 3, so that this number 666 and the image of the papacy, the image of the beast, or the image to the beast, is, is when church and state combine to enforce Sunday. So it says here, um, I'll just read this over again. Andrew saw a typological relationship between the condition of Daniel's three friends. So typology, that just means he sees it was a typical of what was gonna happen in the end, it was a type. Uh, when a decree was issued 
uh, to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 3, and the situation of the church when the decree goes forth that all shall worship the image of the beast on pain of death. In the context of a similar eschatological, that just means end time conflict, Cottrell appointed to analogy between the power and authority of the beast and his image. So Cottrell here is um, uh, the father of the other Cottrell, I believe. Which Cottrell is this? Um, Dwight, do you remember the names of the different Cottrells? So you got... Not off the top of my head, no. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm terrible with names. But anyway, this is not the Cottrell of the later years um, that knew Desmond Ford. This is, the, er, this is his father. Um, now, I'm just going to read here because they, they have the footnote here. Um, Cottrell, speaking of the image in Re Review and Herald, December 12th, 1854, page 134. In the context of a fast-growing Roman Catholic Church in the USA, the formation of a united front of Protestants seems to him the solution to prevent annexation of the, by the Catholics. He thought it inevitable, and now this is the quote, that Protestants must unite to oppose this lawmaking church by the exercise of the same kind of power, by constituting themselves another lawmaking church. The moment this is done, the image of the beast will be complete. The beast was church and state united. The image will be the same. Um, so, so this is, and we can see here how when we're looking at, and we've seen in Colin's study, we've seen in Odilio's study, that when we see what has happened here with the, the pandemic, uh, with the mandates, we can see that we have state power, um, and it, it's a type of the Sunday law, but it's not the church exercising this power. So, so there are some ways in which it typifies the Sunday law and some ways in which it doesn't. Now, we also know that, of course, the Adventist church is supporting or supportive of uh, the vaccines, but not all the churches are. That is, we don't have the Protestant churches united uh, upon this idea that we need to have this vaccine mandate. And actually, many churches are opposed to it. Um, but, but we can see how there's some similarities. So we could look at the pandemic as a type of the Sunday law because the state is going to uh, uh, enforce a decree against the conscience of people. But it's not really a religious test. Maybe for some people personally it is, but for the vast majority of people, it has nothing to do with religion. It's not, so it's not testing people's... Uh, fidelity to God just because they reject the vaccine or even if they receive the vaccine that somehow that they've rejected God right so developing that, probably developing developing the mindset in people mm -hmm. probably well yeah so what we see happening and um, is we can see that one is governments are testing how far they can push the populace uh, but the other thing is it's also part of a conditioning process that you have crises where our rights are re removed and you see how far you can push the population and then you pull back and and what people will then believe is well the government can only go so far but every time something happens it goes a little farther and we saw this with 911 where 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 our rights um after 911 where our constitutional rights infringed upon by the Patriot Act. Hi, guys. Hi, Mark. So, so after 9-11, were our rights infringed upon by the Patriot Act? Yes. Okay, so what kind of rights? Well, you, uh, they could pick you up and take you to jail without any representation. Okay, so some of the, the, the basic rights for a fair trial, that is you were yeah. guilty until proven innocent if you were deemed to be a terrorist. And of course, Americans and people around the world went along with this because 
One is, I'm not a terrorist. I have nothing to worry about, right? Yep. It doesn't affect me. It just affects somebody. But but we know that when it affects somebody, someone else's rights, that ultimately it does affect my rights. We can agree with that, correct? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, so in this context, when we start to think about uh, what's happening here in Daniel chapter three, um, we can see that uh, that we've been in the Sunday law, so to speak, since 9-11, because this this ability of, of the governments to to create this series of crises or to allow to take advantage of crises, even if they don't originate them, it is leading to uh, basically um, an acceptance that our rights can be taken away by the government for the good of all. And of course, once we take away our con constitutional rights, it's never going to be for the good of all. It's only going to be for the good of a few. Okay, so um, now we're going to read here. This is uh, the first beast received the power to kill of the dragon. The image will receive the same power and authority from the two horned beast. The dragon power of the ten horned monster gave his seat and authority to the Catholic Church. That's that's uh, Revelation chapter 12. And the dragon power of another beast will give his authority to another church. Give civil power into the hands of the Protestants, and the result will be a holy war against heretics. So, so this is just the idea of what the image of the beast is. Now, they're going to be addressing, and, and I should mention here, if we, we go back to this uh, the beginning of this chapter the whole chapter is on the beast and his image so I'm, I'm skipping the part where they identify the beast as being the united states um maybe i shouldn't have maybe i should have gone through all of this um i'm going to deal with the uh, all of this information but i'm just starting here in section c and now we're moving to section d um so now we're going to address the number 666. So we de dealt with the image, the image beast, now the number 666. During the early years of the movement, there existed several interpretations of the number 666. After the disappointment, a correspondent of the Western Midnight Cry referred to it as signifying the number of denominations, presumably in the USA. And so I read those articles, um, and this is quite clear that this is what uh, many people started to believe is that the number 666 referred to the number of Protestant denominations. So that's why when uh, Ellen White in a Word to a Little Flock says that I saw that the number of the image beast was made up, when uh, we look at the number 666 in brackets there, this would lead to this view that the number would be the number of the Protestant churches. So, um, in 1847, James White stated that the last power, Christendom, that treads down the saints is brought to view in Revelation 13, 11 to 18. <clears throat> His number is 666. At the same time, he referred to this passage as a description of the closing strife with the image beast. This seems to imply that the term image beast was used as a descriptive term for the two horned beast, which has been interpreted as, as an image of the first beast in Revelation 18. That is, we understand that when the United Church forms the image to the beast, it is the two horned power that is the image to the, of the beast. Right, the United States makes an image to the beast in itself. It becomes the image of the beast because it acts like the first beast of Revelation 13. Thus, to, um, 
to James White, the image beast or two horned beast represented the Christian represented Christendom, while its number was 666. In 1850, George W. Holt also defined the image beast as the two horned beast with its number 666. So I read his article, the 1850 article. Um, so this is correct. Uh, the 1850 chart designated the two horned beast as the image of the papacy, having 666 as its number. In 1851, Andrews suggested that the Protestant church, image to the beast, may, if taken as a whole, be considered as a unit, but how near its different sects, numbered or number 603 score and six may be a matter of interest to determine. So what they were looking at in 1851 is, how do we determine the number of the different Christian churches? So later, Lofbor quoted J.M. Stephenson, a Sabbatarian uh, Adventist minister for a few years, who stated that the 666 was the number of a man, the man of sin representing the Roman Catholic Church. This church, according to Stephenson, continued to be a unit until the Reformation when it started to break up. And these divisions, have continued dividing and subdividing until, according to the Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, they now number about 603 score and six. So what he was understanding is that, which is very similar to these other views, the number of Protestant churches, but just the subdivision of the Catholic Church um, after the 1260 years. So it was dividing, indicating an instrument intimate relationship between contemporary Protestantism and historic Roman Catholicism. Thus, he could also state about the Protestant churches that their number is the number of a man, the man of sin, and his number is 603 score and six. Those churches collectively or individually have that number. So you can see here that there is an increasing understanding of the significance of the two horned beast and a way, a, a way that they're trying to understand this number 666 as it relates to the two horned beast. Um, now, one of the issues that, that existed when the church began to organize, he's going to talk about this here, is that one of the reasons Adventists didn't want to organize, they believed that if they did organize, they would become one of that number. So it says in, he says here, um, Dempsey, in 1860, steps were taken to organize the Sabbatarian Adventists officially into an effective organizational structure for missionary outreach, which implied legal incorporation of church property under the laws of the state. Plans for organizational unity were resisted by those believers who maintained that the number 666 referred to the two-horned beast and signified the total number of legally organized churches in the USA. According to James White, these opponents felt that in order to get the victory over the number of his name, it is supposed to be necessary to reject all sectarian names. One opponent to organization, Cottrell, advocated the principle of total separation of church and state and warned that the consequence of getting incorporated as a religious body according to law would imply a name with the two-horned beast and spiritual fornication with the kings of the earth. For it would mean that one would look to the civil arm for aid and protection. To this, James White replied that the number 666 referred to the papal beast and not to the two-horned beast, and added that already in 1845, some declared the number 666 to be full, that there was that number of legally organized bodies. Since that time, there have been almost numberless divisions and new associations, and still the number is just 666. Also rejected by James White was the idea that to hold legal property of any kind would be spiritual fornication because obedience to the laws of the country, as long as they did not interfere with God's laws, was not violation of the principle of church-state separation. Thus, a change of attitude was brought about toward the government of the USA, which paved the way for the official organization of the religious body in 1863. Although the number 666 was thought to refer to the first beast of Revelation 13, there was still uncertainty about its significance. Uh, Roswell F. Cottrell, right? 
Thanks, Dwight. R.F. Cottrell, that's the one referring to here. Now, although the number 666 was thought to refer to the first beat of, beast of Revelation 13, there was still uncertainty about its significance. However, in 1865, Smith gave an explanation, which was generally accepted by the SDA, in referring to an anonymous work entitled The Reformation in 1832. He stated, the most plausible name we have ever seen, suggested as containing the number of the beast, is the blasphemous title which the Pope applies to himself and wears in jeweled letters upon his mitre or pontifical crown. He explained that the Latin, Latin letters of the Pope's title, Vicarius Filei Dei, that's uh, spelt wrong there, Vice Generator of the Son of God, had the numerical value of 666. We have V, which is 5, I, which is 1, C, which is 100, A and R are not used as numerals, etc. So we know how that works. All these numbers together, we have just 666. Smith saw this number as the number of a man, even the man of sin, and considered the selection of the Pope's title somewhat providential, showing the blasphemous character of the beast, and then cause it to be inscribed upon his mitre, as if to brand himself with the number 666. Okay, so, so this is just some background information. Now, when we go back uh, to the chart here, we can see that there's uh, an increase of understanding of this image of the papacy. And the two lamb-like horns, which would be either papist and protestant, however they would be understand, stood here, they've been amended to be republicanism and protestantism, which we understand today. Ellen White affirms that view. And whose names number 666, this would be the understanding of the day that these are the number of Protestant churches or sects in the United States. And these become united in act, action, speak like a dragon, and control the civil legislature and cause it to make themselves the image of the papacy. But here it says the church, whether that's, that is a big difference or not, I don't think so, but to make the church the image of the papacy, which received a deadly wound and was healed. Um, so how do we understand this being on the 1850 chart? I've, I've spent a lot of time discussing with various people um, regarding this, people who reject the 1843 and 1850 charts, and some use this on the 1850 chart as a reason for its rejection. That it says, this is a ridiculous view that's presented here on the chart. And so Ellen White's endorsement of the chart doesn't mean that everything on it's correct. How would we answer them? Do we believe that the 1850 chart was directed by God and what's on it? For myself, I will say yes. Okay. So however they understood it, just like on the 1843 chart. Yeah, Mark? Uh, I don't know. Okay. So... Uh, um um i you know video you know you may really have like a talk mm -hmm. on uh our class time and on on the the phone yeah you know about did mission of my life i have grown up and 19 years ago. Yeah, I know, Mark, but that's not the topic of study right now. Yes, uh, I say this. Uh, means of this make um, you did say and about visions I have books of 
the means of the cause of my neck make me to not pick up my own claws. Make okay. me not uh, hold me back. Yes, I did say hold me back, not pick up the claws to follow in that step of that that faith. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So one of the things we need to look at with this chart, first is that we have a column. So remember that this chart is made in columns. And what's the purpose of these columns? How would we describe this? Kind of like putting them on lines, the ver vertical, yeah. the vertical line. Yeah, it's like a line upon line, isn't it? Right. So if you, I mean, it's kind of hard to see the whole chart in detail here, but but you can see they're going to have uh, the beast of Revelation or, or Daniel chapter seven. They're going to have this here. Obviously, this is not going to line up completely um, here, but but you can see the feet of the image are dealing with with pagan Rome, but they also are going to address papal Rome. So they just couldn't fit that all in. They're going to have the three angels' messages. So this is a type of line upon line, though they're not they are not all starting at the same spot, particularly, because um, this here is going to be Revelation chapter 9 um, and uh, dealing with the, the first and second and third woe. Uh, but this column here in the center is dealing with, uh, first it starts with, Daniel chapter 8, and it's going to move into Revelation 12 and Revelation 13. So why are they doing this? What's what's the, the purpose of looking at Daniel chapter 8 here in this column? And why are we connecting it with Revelation 12 and 13? Why are they doing this? Okay, I couldn't understand anything you said, Patricia. He's all sorry, sorry, I'm translating, so we've got some Spanish voices. Ah, on. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it, okay. one of they said that they were the way they're lined up is um, the space and time where Daniel had the visions. He was having a, a different spaces, but they're because they're the same power um that i, I think I, that's how the question was understood okay so well the main thing that i would see here is they're going to daniel chapter 8 because there's two desolating powers right pagan and papal that are going to persecute god's people right you so it starts out here how long shall be the vision concerning concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to both give the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And their understanding still at that time was that you're going to start the transgression of desolation in 677 at least, right? So we know that this is going to begin with Babylon. But it also includes Assyria because we know that there is 1260 years from the captivity of Hoshea to 538 and another 1260 years of the time of the transgression of desolation so they're dealing here with the 2300 days but they're also including the period of the daily so media persia and greece and pagan rome are all going to be the daily or not the daily yeah the daily and then papal rome is going to be the transgression of desolation and then you're going to see it end here when the seventh angel sounds. So that's going to be October 22nd, 1844. And then the United States is going to start shortly before then. So the image of the papacy is going to happen after 1798. So what they're roughly doing is, is showing that this line has to do with this continuation of these beasts that are seen in 
uh, Daniel chapter 8, and then also in Revelation 12 and 13. And so that would be my understanding of why they have this all in this column. Does that make sense to people? Did I explain it well enough and somebody not really understand what I'm saying? I could see the continuation from Daniel to Revelation. Okay. Yeah, and so I they're going all that. yeah, so they're all going back to to the twenty three hundred days, but even before that, because the twenty three hundred days is going to be something in the future from Daniel chapter eight, right? He's he's in the time of Nebuchadnezzar when he has the vision in Daniel chapter eight. So he's in the time of Babylon. So he's it so he's in that period of uh of the first 1260, I mean, he's in the whole period of the 2520, but he's before 457 BC when he has that vision. But he's going to be carried in vision to 457 v BC, even though he's in Babylon at the time. So when they ask the question, how long shall be the vision? The answer to that question, uh, is during the uh, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot and the answer unto 2300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed we can see that when there's this conversation going on between daniel and and the angel that this conversation is in this period of pagan uh, the pagan period, the daily, prior to the 2300 days beginning. So the 2300 days are going to start in the future. But the vision that he's brought to is he's brought to Shushan the palace in that vision. So he's bought, brought to Persia in 457 BC to see the beginning of the 2300 days in vision. But this conversation is in the time that he was living then, because the question of how long would be in that context. Now, then we also gonna have, um, uh, from there, we're gonna see this little horn power. And so the little horn is the papacy, but we're gonna see that the papacy uh, is gonna be given its power from pagan Rome. So that's gonna be the daily, that's part of the daily. And then the papacy is now the second part of the two desolating powers, the transgression of desolation or the abomination of desolation. So that's gonna be papal Rome here in this context. But the United States, which follows after, it's going to make an image to the beast and the beast being the papacy, that combination of church and state. So that's the context here. <clears throat> now, when they say their name's number 666, they may understand it a certain way, but does that mean that that just that, that, that their understanding of how they understand the name's numbering 666 has to be how we understand what's on the 1850 chart? That is, they write something on the 1850 chart that they understand in a certain way, but does that mean that we have to understand it in the same way they did? No, because we live in a, we have more information. We live in okay. And the, at the end of Adventisms, you know. Yeah, so, so we have more information, but we also have some misinformation too. That is, there's things that have developed in Adventism that we understand. Uh, to be true, that we accept. But when we look at this as a Seventh-day Adventist and we read the 1850 chart, most people wouldn't know what they're talking about. Um, so when it says whose name is number 666, when the Bible says it's a number of his na of name and the number is 666, we, we would have to try to understand how this is on the 1850 chart and what it means to us. That's, that's what we would have to do because we have to we have to figure out what the choices are. We have a choice. 
we can say, well, the 1850 chart just has views that we don't longer, no longer hold. And so we can just pick and choose. We can just say, well, something's on the 1850 chart we no longer agree with, so we can just ignore it. So that's one choice that we have. We can also say that sort of the opposite choice is since it's on the 1850 chart and since they understood it a certain way, we have to then understand it the way they understood it because it's a pioneer view. It's on the 1850 chart. It's endorsed by Ellen White. And, and so we would have to accept what it says at face value based upon how they understood it. Or we, we could have another choice where we say they understood it a certain way, but they didn't understand it completely. Now, when it comes to this chart having this change here, so it's edited, you'll see that there's a few different edits on the 1850 chart. There is the edits there that we, we showed you. And then we're also going to see that they made an edit here um, where they're trying to deal with the fullness of the year and they changed 1843 to 1844. And this is actually not a good edit um, in the sense that it's incorrect. Why is it incorrect? Why would I say that this correction from 1843 to 1844 is wrong? Because it still says 45 right there. Okay, so what this is counting is the 45 years from 1260, from the end of the 1260 to 1843. So now they have here 1798-9, right? So, so this here was trying to address the fullness of the year and, and it was unclear what they meant. So when they when they originally put the date here, they had 1843. They you can see the sort of bit of whiteout, and then they uh, put another four over there in a different font. But this makes the math not work out. Uh, so this 45 years, sure it does end in 1844, but it's the end of the Jewish year, 1844, which would be April 19th, right? 1843, pardon me, uh, which is April 19th, 1844. So it doesn't make sense to put 44 there, right? I mean, obviously, if you're adding the 45 years to the nine, 1799, but we really don't mark 1799 generally. We mark 1798. So this was this was trying to, to account for the fact that there was no zero year and, and saying that the year 1798 actually the jewish year is going to span into the year it's going to start somewhere in the year 1798 and it's going to go to the year 1799 but but that's not really a good way of doing it but that's how they did it but you could see the confusion arose that they they felt they had to edit it by putting 1844 instead of 1843 there Now, you're also going to see some other things on here. Um, it talks about the length of the daily, Daniel 8.13, from 4.57 to 5.08. And that's going to be 965 years. So what are they doing there? W what is that a reference to? The 965 years. So they're going to go from 4.57 B.C., to 508 and they're going to say it's 965 years is it 965 years from 457 bc to 508 no no it's 964 years correct yeah so that's why they have to put the nine there but do we have the nine like well, I mean, we could say, you know, it's um, because the baptism of Clovis is December 25th, 508. So you could kind of say that's the beginning of 509 almost. Um, but yeah, it it's unclear because they're trying to they're trying to compensate for the fact that there's no zero year 
and yet to keep the same number of years that they've always counted. That is in the past, they would say from 457 BC to 508 is 965 years. Now it says the length of the daily. Now, do they begin the daily in 457 BC? Did the pioneers ever begin the daily there? Not that I recall. No, so they don't. But they will say that that's the time of the daily from 457 BC to 508. That's the remaining time of the daily, right? But I've seen people argue that, oh, they believe the daily began in 457 BC, and they'll refer to the 1850 chart here, and they'll say, no, the daily doesn't begin until 457. But we know that they understood the daily at least to begin in 677, right, with Babylon. So, so it's just some of these things are a little bit unclear on the chart. The people at the time would understand them. But they made this chart to, to do presentations. That's the purpose of the chart. And um, so, so they have some of these things that are a little bit uh, unclear, but they're, they're doing it for a reason. But would we then reject this because it's, it's unclear? I mean, we know what it means. Now, it's, and it's kind of interesting here. Um, for those of you who've been involved in this movement for a long time and looked at a lot of the attacks on the 2520, one of the things you can watch videos and they will say um, that the 2520 is not on the 1850 chart. Um, we had, uh, um, what was his name, uh, Vance Farrell made that claim when he first started attacking the 2520. Says it's not on the 1850 chart. Now is the 2520 on the 1850 chart? Yep. It's actually a 2520 chart. Uh, if you look at it, it starts this timeline here in 677 and it's gonna end in 1844. And that's going to be 25, 20 years. So it is a 25, 20 chart by very definition. Now, his argument is, well, on the 1843 chart, it was in really big numbers, right? It was really big font. And now it's just, so, so later when he, he realized that it was on here, he then tried to argue, well, now it's just this little footnote in the corner that you need a magnifying glass to read. Now, of course, that isn't the case. You don't need a magnifying glass to read it unless it's maybe on your iPhone or on your computer. Um, but it's actually, the chart is fairly big. This would be pretty big font, pretty easy to read. Anybody would walk up to the chart just as you can on our chart. And our charts aren't as big as, as the original chart. Now, it's also going to give more explanation of the 2520 uh, than we had on the 1843 chart. So it's going to have uh, the 2520 mentioned here, 7 times 360. And, and then it's going to talk about the treading down of Israel by the Gentiles commenced before Christ, 677, 1843 years after Christ added to 677 makes 2520 years uh, or seven times. So it's going to give us more detail regarding this period of 2520 than is on the 1843 chart. Right, so it's going to talk about that whole period as the treading down, but it's just, it's talking about the two desolating powers, uh, pag paganism and papalism, and, and it's going to cover that whole period. So it's not really looking at the 2520 for northern Israel, it's looking at the 2520 for Judah, which is a treading down of God's church for 25, 20 years. Okay, so when we look at this chart then, is their understanding of everything complete? But is it the foundation of Adventism? 
a foundation doesn't necessarily mean it's totally complete yet. Right. Now, so, you know, I've struggled with this, this section here, trying to understand what it means. Um, but I think one of the things that we will see when we're looking at this view is that there is, it's tied to other things. That is, this isn't something that just occurs in isolation. And they're, they're sorting through an understanding of Revelation 13. And sure, we have Uriah Smith later who says the 666 refers to the, name, the number on, of the name on the mitre. But does 666 mean much more than that? This is going to take us a, a quite a bit of a study. So, um, and we're not going to get it all done today. So we're going to be doing this next Friday as well. We're going to be looking at this in more detail. But how did Miller understand 666? Time period from the League with the Romans to the establishment of the, um, the Roman government just preceding the papacy right so so we know that that miller took it as 666 years was he wrong he was seeing as a historical time period right was he wrong in doing that i don't think so i don't think so either i think he was correct but that doesn't mean that that we're going to say well miller was correct about the 666 years and so that we have no other application of this number. So the number 666 is interesting. Um, now, one of the things about it is if you take the Roman numerals, um, now there's a, a number of them, right? So what are the no Roman numerals that we normally have? We have one is an I. V is a five, X is a 10. C100. C100, and L is, L is 50. And D is 500. Yeah, uh, D is 500. So if you take 500 plus 100 plus 50 plus 10 plus five, plus one, what do you get? Mm -hmm. Anybody know? 666. You get 666. Is that significant? Seems that way, yeah. Okay, so. Should be significant, yeah. Yeah, so again, 500 plus 100 plus 50 so these are all the roman numerals going down from d plus 10 plus 5 plus 1 is 666 so this should be significant this isn't just some coincidence correct agreed okay so so we can see we have at least a symbol here that has to do with Rome. These are Roman numerals. Oh, uh, excuse me, please. Yeah, Mark. Um, I heard from the other. I got my anti-shirty gave me one of uh, in. To my auntie, my auntie Shirley gave me of two hundred years. Uh, my auntie Shirley gave me movie of 
two thousand years old. That man saying about in uh, that man holds he telling a story about Jesus Christ. He said in nine uh, uh, in seventeen ninety seven years. Okay, thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Now, it's also interesting because the letters that are used in this. Yeah. That's the only occurrence of all symbols whose value is less than a thousand in decreasing order. Wow. That, Okay. Okay, so so we can see the six 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 in Roman numerals is significant. That it's not something that just happens. Um and that uh that we can make different applications of 666. Now, next week, we're actually gonna look at the number 666 in a lot more detail um, to try to understand it. Now, one of the things that we've come to understand about the 666 years, so I'm gonna switch over to here. Oh, that's not the one, yeah, that's the one I want, but not the right page. So, So one of the applications of 666 is to take um, from the captivity of Jehoiachin, to the, which is the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem in Leviticus 26, and counting 666 years to the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's in Deuteronomy 28. It ties Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 together by 666 years. Now this is a different period of 666 years than Miller had. Oh, and I, I wanna look at what Miller says about the 666 years. So I need to go there first. Sorry about that. Um, and it's in Miller's works, volume two. And I want you to hear his explanation. It, it's because often we know about his view, but we haven't really read his explanation. Um, so this is going to be uh, the part where he talks about the numbering of the beast. I'm just going to make this bigger for people. Uh, to show what we may understand by the numbering of the beast, and what may we understand by numbering anything of this kind in Scripture. For the Scripture must be our God as we have said before said and one of the things you're going to notice is that Miller's Miller follows Miller's rules which is kind of interesting um, I answer it is to count to finish or to destroy when used in figurative sense or in a prophetic scripture as in Isaiah 22 10 and ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall they were accused by the prophet of destroying houses by numbering them or counting them for destruction. Again, see Isaiah 65, 12. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall bow down to the slaughter. Here again it is used in the same sense. I will reckon or count you to the sword. Again, Daniel 5, 25 and 26. And this is the handwriting that was written, meaning, meaning of tekel euphorson. This is the interpretation of the thing, meaning God hath numbered thy kingdom and hath finished it. As therefore the idolatrous and blasphemous kingdom of Babylon was numbered and finished by God, whose decree was conveyed by the handwriting on the wall to the knowledge of Daniel and others, so was John commanded by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write in his last book of prophecy the meanie tackle of this idolatrous 
pagan beast. Here is wisdom. Let a wise Daniel or him that hath the wisdom of God like De led Daniel, or let him that hath understanding in the word of God, or him that will compare scripture with scripture, count the number of the beast or the number of his name. Let us inquire what is the name of the beast. His name is blasphemy because he causes all both low and high, rich and poor, bond and free to worship stocks and stones, idols of gold and silver and wood that can neither see nor hear nor talk. Um, so here he's talking about the pagan power of Rome in the image of, or the beast of Revelation 12. So he's going to apply this to the beast of Revelation 12, not to the beast of Revelation 13. Um, but he sees a continuation of this. So, so he kind of sees them as part of the same power, even though there's pagan Rome and papal Rome. Now, so he's going to deal a lot about numbering. So we number our days. I'm not going to, because we don't have much time here. Um, so he says, uh, Moses in Exodus 23, 26, the number of thy days will I fulfill. Job speaking of a man says, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months is with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. David says in Psalm 90, 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Therefore, we may reasonably conclude that the number of a man is the number of his days. And scriptures often speak of man in connection with his time of sojourn on the earth, calling it days as few and evil have been the days of my pilgrimage. Um, died being old of, and full of days. Length of days is in her ha right hand. All the days of thy life. I will wait the days of my appointed time until my change come. If this is the understanding of this part of our text, which I cannot see any reason to doubt, then our text has this plain meaning. Here is a need of spiritual wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of his days, for his days are numbered as a man's, and they are 603 score and six. This power, Rome pagan, would be taken away when his 666 prophetic days should end. And this brings us to show when those days began, and of course when they an ended. They must have begun when the Jewish rites and ceremonies were in being, for this was the sole object of paganism, to counteract the Jewish rituals and draw the Jewish worship worshipers into idolatry and to blend the heathen rites with theirs. They must have begun before Christ was born, for the great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns was to stand before the woman, the Jewish church, ready to devour the man-child as soon as it was born. They could have not begun before they became connected with the Jews, for the reason that no nation is prophesied of or noticed in prophecies, except that they are somehow connected with the people of God. And for the very reason that this beast was to tread down the Jews, and finally, by cunning, deceit, and intrigue, destroy the city and nation of the Jews, then I think the first conclusion is that when they became connected with Jews by league, and when they had conquered Daniel's third kingdom, the Grecian, then and not until then had the Romans any part in this prophecy. And this agrees with the angel's statement, Daniel eleven twenty three. After the league made with him, that is the Romans, he shall work deceitfully and become strong with a small Republican people. This league was made between the Romans and the Jews, ratified and carried into effect when the Greeks under Bacchides left besieging Jerusalem upon the command of the Romans, and as Josephus and Maccabees tell us, never returned to trouble them, the Jews, anymore. This league then took effect when the third kingdom of Daniel's vision ceased harassing the Jews, and the fourth kingdom began its rule over the Jews in the world. This was in the year BC 158. But those who wish to be satisfied with the correctness of the foregoing statements, read the eighth and ninth chapters of 1 Maccabees and Josephus, uh, book 12, chapter 10, section 6, in his Antiquities. Then if this be correct, the pagan Rome, that pagan Rome began his power in the year BC 158 and was to continue 666 years, when would paganism fall in the Roman kingdom and the daily sacrifice abomination be taken out of the way to make room for the abomination of desolation? I answer, take 158 from 666 and you have 508. Then in the year 8508, paganism ceased. Now we know there's some partial things that he doesn't notice here. 
but would we agree with him on how he's establishing BC 158? Conceptually, it sounds right. Yeah. Now, some people look at 161, but is that what he's talking about? Is he talking about 158 or 161 when he talks about the league? Dwight, what happened in 161 that differentiates 161 from 158? I don't know if you're there, Dwight. So maybe we'll look at this a bit ne next week. But when he's establishing 158, now one of the arguments is if you count from 158 to 508, you would have to count that inclusively as 666 years. Is that a problem? So if you count from 158 to 508, you add them together, you get 666, but you, you're not accounting for the fact there's no zero year. So you'd have to count, if you're going to have a cardinal count, you'd have to go from 159. But is it okay to count in uh, an inclusive count or an ordinal count of 666 years? Is that a problem for anybody? Not sure. <laughs> okay, so it shouldn't be a problem. We know that we can count inclusively. Now, especially since what is the event that marks the end of the 666 years that we've in our morning studies come to conclude that is the event that marks that end? So the 666 years end with what event in 508? Well, uh, Clovis. Clovis yeah, being Clovis. baptized on December 25th. So yeah. it was previously right. believed that Clovis was baptized in 496 on December 25th. But we now understand that that's in five yeah. or eight. So. Yeah, Mark. I did add the numbers. Num I did add up numbers. I got of eight to four. Okay, but you're supposed to subtract them. I did. So, at, I I did add it. Okay, you added eight two four. Okay, thanks, Mark. <laughs> okay. Um. So anyway, we're we're gonna look at this in a bit more detail. We're gonna look at the six hundred and sixty six years, both the Millers, and we also have two other periods of six hundred and sixty six years. Now, if we can say that we can use 666 years, does that discount any other application we make of 666? They seem to be second, second witnesses. Right, so we can see that we can make applications of different periods of 666 years that are all tied together, but also we can, we can talk about the number in other ways. It has, it's a symbol. So one of the things that, that I did in, in my study of chronology, which is, so when we go back to this chart of 666 years, what we're seeing is that this is Babylon and this is Rome. Now we apply 666 to Rome, both to pagan Rome as Miller does, but can we apply it to papal Rome? That is, can we see that when we, we can tie Babylon to Rome by 666 years, that that number 
is being passed from Babylon to Rome. You're saying besides the uh, the uh, number on the martyr mitre? Yes, but 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 even the number on the mitre can be applied, right? Yeah, yeah, I know that can, but right. You meant. But that number doesn't just show up in Rome out of nowhere. It comes from Babylon, doesn't it? Yeah. So so Babylon, this is a the Babylonian number of six six six, gets transferred to Rome pagan and then with the other periods of 666 years it gets transferred to rome papal right so we have this 666 years that gives babylon connects babylon to pagan rome and then we're going to have two other periods of 666 years one that begins in 158 BC and ends in 508, and another one that begins in 129 BC and ends in 538. And all of those three periods of 666 years are connected in that they're showing this transition of this power Excuse me, from please. Babylon all the way to Rome. And then we see in Revelation 13 that the image of the beast is also going to have this number 666 attached to it. So we need to understand what 666 represents and not get caught up in, well, it's it's on the Pope's mitre, so it's just pointing to the Pope. Because we need to recognize that this number is a prophetic number and is tied to all kinds of things. It's also tied to Islam. So multiple, witnesses, it's, it's, multiple witnesses. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, we're going to close with prayer. We're going to come back to this study next Friday. So this is kind of... Uh, is it Mark? And up here. Yeah, Mark? It's um, 660 years. 666 years. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, so we're going to come back to this next Friday. And I figure it's going to take three, like two more studies to get through this 666. Um, but you can see the problem. So the problem is that I think that our, our understanding is limited. It's actually inhibited by the fact that we have one view that we have just accepted as being the correct view. And just like they, we recognize there's two different periods of 25, 20 years, that are part of a structure. We also have to recognize that these numbers 666 are providing a structure that that we can't ignore. And that this they're is like, giving us more light. What's what's that, Jeff? So the church, they just they just do the martyr. Martyr. They don't have any second right. multiple witnesses to that. It's just well, right. that's it. Yeah, they, yeah, they just go there and and, and that's not wrong, but the thing is, that's not the complete picture. No, yeah, people need people need a more of a background of the six six six. Yeah, and just so I, just a martyr. Exactly. So I think that we need to recognize that there's something on the eighteen fifty chart that we haven't fully understood. We just sort of ignore it. But I don't think that the eighteen fifty chart is wrong. I just think that our understanding of what's on there has never been completed. That is, it started with something that was eventually just abandoned instead of continuing to understand what was being revealed by God. So in a sense, what was on the 1850 chart was also rejected regarding 666, just as the 2520 was rejected on the 1843 chart. And so we can see that the 2520 has its significance, but also 666 has its significance as periods of time that tie us to, that tie all these things together. Now, just to leave you with a final thought. So one of the things is when you add six and seven together, what do you get? 13. What is 13? Rebellion. Rebellion. Rebellion, right? 
And we see this in Revelation 13. That's what we're just studying. Dice, here. Vemos eso. And the other thing that we need to, to see here is that I'm going to try to show in, in as we go through these studies is that the number six and seven coming together to make 13 also occurs in all other kinds of ways. That is, this is about the great controversy between Christ and Satan. The number of 777 and the number of 666. These numbers come together in, in prophecy, in the great controversy issues that arise. So I know this is a rather involved study, and, and we have all these different balls in the air, so to speak, that we're, we're trying to, to address as we're looking at Colin study, Odilio study, etc. But we, we can see that we don't understand everything completely yet and that we need to take the time to do so. So my appeal to people is to spend some time going through the pioneers writing, reading about what they write about 666. And, and you know, maybe there's things that, you know, that we're going to find that are surprising, just like we did with Revelation 12. 13 and 17, their understanding of the, the seven heads. And, and what I believe that we can see is that when we go back and look at the foundation, that everything is going to come together, that we're going to see that, that these different applications that are being made aren't wrong, but they are not complete. That is, we need to see all of the applications we need to understand this more fully and that just because we have one interpretation or one application made with the symbol doesn't mean that that is all there is. And so, you know, once we get through this, we're going to be looking at the, all the different seven kings and, and so forth, but we need to look at this first. And so I think, you know, two more studies on this and we should have at least a basic understanding of 666. So. Thanks for your time. Let's uh, close with prayer. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Mark. I am three working of the book. I'm the board from the library. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. For me. Okay. Anyway, we're going to pray now, Mark. Yeah, yeah I can see it. Yeah. This book. I ask you about this book. Yeah. Is it good for me to read it? I don't know. I haven't read it. Why, why not? Because I, I never heard of it before until you told me about it. But anyway, we got to pray, Mark. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath. We know, Lord, that... Um, as we look at the study here, we may feel that there's just so much we don't know, but we know that you are teaching us and guiding us and leading us as we seek to look at the foundation. And so we ask for your continued help. We're thankful for the Sabbath and the opportunity we have in our studies. We're thankful for the study tomorrow that Dwight will give and also the study in the afternoon with Stephen. We pray that you can bless both of them and that uh, your Holy Spirit can speak through them. We pray, Lord, for this movement. We know that um, you are seeking to bring us into a covenant relationship with you. And we know that when we do so, that we'll be united with one another. And so we ask for this work to be accomplished upon our hearts. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Recording stopped. Well, thanks.